Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, my name is Oshin. I'm going to be giving you a brief introduction into um, who are we here at Randox Laboratories. And then I'm going to be passing you on to my colleague, Stephen. Um, he's going to be talking to you then about the importance of external quality assessment. First thing, I'm going to give you an introduction, quick introduction to Randox Laboratories. So who are we here at Randox? Uh, Randox is a world leader in individual diagnostic industry. Uh, we have nearly 40 years experience. Uh, Randox pro products offer clinicians and physicians the most comprehensive insight into patients' diagnostics, allowing them for more effective disease management and treatment. Okay, so Randox uh, was a global leader in health diagnostics. The company was founded in 1982 in County Antrim. Uh, we manufacture 3.5 billion tests per year. Randox are used to diagnose over 370 million people worldwide, which is equaling about 5% of the world's population. Therefore, making Randox Laboratories the largest manufacturer in the UK, um, with over 95% of all products worldwide um, exported. Our products and services are used in hospitals, clinical, clinical research, molecular laboratories, food diagnostics, life sciences and veterinary uh, laboratories. Randox has the world's largest EKA scheme, RICUS, uh, which is over 45,000 participants. We are the third in the world quality control and calibrators and the fifth largest manufacturer in clinical climate reagents. We produce 10% of the world's cholesterol tests and have 35 regional, national and international collaborations. 100,000 laboratories over the world use Randox products and also, we also provide OEM products which are sold under other manufacturers' names. Uh, back in 2020, we built a molecular laboratory in response to the growing COVID-19 testing in the UK and Ireland. Our lab, we currently have the capacity for 100,000 patient samples a day and we conduct around 20,000 of the coronavirus tests performed by the National Health Service within the UK and Ireland. Um, currently, we've delivered over 14 million samples to date. Um, our extensive range of products covers all our areas of clinical testing and materials suitable for core laboratory practice. Thank you for joining our webinar today um, on the importance of external quality assessment. Um, the webinar will be hosted by Stephen Doherty, our RICUS EQA Scheme Manager. Stephen studied in Ulster University and graduated with BSc Honours in Applied Biochemical Science. In 1992, Stephen was involved in all aspects of the department work, but especially managing technical queries, report validations and software development for RICUS. In 2004, he took up a managerial position within the department he has travelled widely, representing Reckless in international trade shows, conferences, uh, user group meetings and CME events. In the past 29 years, he and his colleagues have developed Reckless into one of the world's largest proficiency test providers. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I'm going to pass you on now to Stephen to talk to you then about the importance of external quality assessment. Thanks. Okay, we'll just move on and see. Yes, um, hopefully you can uh, still see uh, see the screen, and hopefully you can uh, hear me. Okay, uh, I'm just going to spend the next uh, 45, 50 minutes uh, talking about some of the important aspects of why we need to run external quality assessments. Uh, it is going to be quite a, a broad overview and um, we're not going to go into um, a huge amount of details about the external quality assessment uh, itself. Uh, these are really the fundamentals of why you need to run EQA. Um, really looking at this slide, you can see from where there is a clinical question 
to actually getting a, a clinical response to an answer. There are many areas where errors can occur in the process. So I know we're talking today mainly about quality control, but there's room for, there are errors that can occur in all aspects through the, uh, from the request to the actual reporting of the results. We have found that there's about two thirds of the information that is used by physicians uh, whenever they're making their diagnosis and uh, comes from laboratory testing. If that testing is incorrect or if there's errors in that, what's their consequences? Well, it can mean a repeated test, uh, misdiagnosis, uh, leading to then inappropriate treatment of the patient. These all result in increased costs to the laboratory, but more importantly, uh, that can mean obviously patient care may be compromised. Now, whenever we're talking about errors, uh, errors occur in all labs, from the smallest lab uh, to the largest, um, from here in the UK, South America, to the Far East, uh, errors occur in all labs. So this is why we need to put a, a quality system in place. Uh, because really what we say is a lab with a quality system, they will still have errors, uh, but should enable them to detect them quicker and therefore reducing their impact to the, the patient. Why do we need a quality management system? Uh, here on the left of the screen, we have an example. And uh, it's not that many years ago, whenever I was out visiting uh, with some of the labs, that they would have presented their internal QC in this fashion. Uh, certainly, uh, more recently, we have the development of uh, Levy Jennings charts with standard deviation CVs and then the introduction of multi rules and multi rules are becoming more and more prevalent. Um, but there's still areas that can occur. And it's not just a simple two dimensional, it is a multi faceted aspect. Um, so although quality, labor, laboratory quality is primarily based on standard deviations or the coefficient of variation from looking at your QC data, if you look at it sometimes from different perspectives, you will get a different picture and notice aspects that you may have missed. And no longer should we just look at quality control, but we need to look at quality management. And to do this, we need a good QC management tool. And EQA is part of that tool. It's part of that management process because not only with the internal QC, with the external quality assessment, and even with the peer group assessments, then they're all giving us slightly different but valuable information. How do we minimize the laboratory error? Well, um, the ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, defines a quality management system as those co coordinated activities which are used to direct and control an organization with respect or with regards to their quality. So it's not just the, the QC, but it's all the coordinated activities that go towards that control and they will have a direct impact on the quality of the system and of your patient care. The standard then that has been written, the international standard is the ISO 15189. Now, this is a globally recognized standard that gives specific requirements for quality and for competence. Now, I understand that not all countries will use 15189, but certainly their own quality regulations will very often refer to the 15189 standard. 
It is used by medical laboratories in developing quality management systems. But more importantly to, to note here it is for assessing your own competence. So uh, it's a, a frame uh, to build your own quality system upon. And it's really down to your own assessment of your competence. This is really what this quality management system is about. The standard focuses on this continuum of care directly connected with improved patient safety. How that risk is mitigated, how is it reduced, and how do we improve the operational efficiency? And it's specifically in this case, 15189 is for medical laboratories. So uh, participation in external quality assessment is recommended for all laboratories and is required in the standard, the 15189 standard. So that's a primary reason why we need to run external quality assessments. First of all, because the standard basically recommends and acts not only recommends, but states that they should be run and here it is in the section 5.6.4 from within the standard says that the laboratory shall participate in interlaboratory comparisons such as those organized by external quality assessment schemes. So that's your primary reason, first of all, why you want to run external quality assessments. But um, really, we have to realize that implementation of this of a complete and effective QC package uh, that, although it may appear to represent additional cost to the lab, that uh, in, oh, sorry, in the long term, it will reduce then basically costs by eliminating the need to run unnecessary and sometimes expensive repeat tests. And also it will decrease costs by preventing inappropriate patient care and or treatments. So we're looking at the, the whole process, not just from within the laboratory itself, but the whole health care system. I've, I've got asked this question many times over the years. And um, basically when we look at quality within the lab, um, most labs will, will recognize the, the need for internal quality control. But really what we're looking at here is asking the question, so why is internal QC insufficient by itself? Well, primarily it's because uh, any error that will occur uh, whenever we look at total error, is a combination not only of the precision, but also the bias. It's, uh, it's the accuracy or the, the precision and or the imprecision and the inaccuracy. It's this combination of both errors. And this is the general formula that uh, is typically shown. So it's the total error, TE, total error, uh, is your percentage bias plus 1.96 times the CV. Now, why the 9.96? That is because it's looking at a confidence limit of 95%. So whenever we look at one standard deviation, um, and we'll look at this at the next slide. So whenever we look at one standard deviation between the, the mean and then, say this is one standard deviation and two standard deviations. So anytime you measure a result, and you measure it again and again and again, you will have a spread of results. And normally in a normal distribution, this is what you'll see. So in order to have a 95% confidence that your result will fall within this range, then this is the equivalent of 1.96 or two standard deviations. We can obviously, if you want to be uh, improve that even further, then you would potentially go to a three standard deviation range. But this is what we're saying about then the difference between precision and then accuracy. So in this case, if this is 
the value whenever we measure the sample uh, time and time again, we will have a normal distribution of results. But the difference between what the value that we are seeing and what the true value is, then this is our bias, or it gives an indication of the trueness of the, the, the value. So the important aspects to see here is precision is normally dealt with as I'm sure many of you are aware is with your internal quality control. This is how we look at our precision. And then our external quality assessment is where we deal and we look at the accuracy. So why is that important? Well, specifically whenever we look around a, the, uh, a normal distribution of results, specifically around a clinical cutoff point, so in this case here, for example, if the uh, 40 millimoles or whatever the, the unit is, if this was a clinically significant cutoff value, and then this was our measurement of that, and if we were to measure it multiple times, potentially our result would turn out here. This is our mean. But sometimes our results would be over the clinical threshold. Uh, similarly, on the other side, it can happen again. Uh, sometimes in this situation, if that was a clinical cutoff point and we are looking for values below that or above it. Some cases in this, in, in this situation, uh, for example, if you're looking for a value greater than your clinical cutoff, in this case is here, yes, the majority of times you will get a result which is outside of that range. And so you would take appropriate active action. But in some situations, you will also have results which are uh, still below that clinical cutoff value. And so potentially you won't take action when actually you should have. Now, if we can control the precision, then obviously the more confidence that we will have that uh, the value which we're uh, obtaining um, is appropriate and we're going to take appropriate action. However, there's still then this indication of bias. So if we were to move this bell-shaped curve to the left or to the right, then we will still potentially maybe be completely away from what the true value is. So this is where we're looking at the accuracy of the, of the assessment. So we, to reduce the systematic error uh, of this data set, so you need to identify the source of the error. Uh, and unfortunately, unless you do that, then you'll never reduce the systematic error by taking more measurements. Going back to that previous slide, as we say, the more results that we take, we'll still fall within normally within this bell-shaped curve. But if we don't know what the error is, then we may still have a, a large bias, which is giving us then false information. Sorry, whenever I say false information, it's giving us sorry, a false assessment of uh, the that we then reporting to the clinician. So yes, what we need to do, we want to not only improve our trueness by decreasing our systematic errors, we want to improve our precision by decreasing our random errors. Uh, so we want to basically hit our targets. So we don't want to be random results. Uh, we want to be precise, but we want to be precise and accurate. So this is our, our main goal. So a few case studies just to, to emphasize the point of why internal QC isn't sufficient in itself. So in this case here, we had a laboratory who came to us and they didn't have any drift on their internal QC. So their internal QC was fine, 
They also then were running a, a, a second EQA scheme and the performance in that lab or in that scheme was spying as well. And this is uh, on Rickus, this was what they were seeing. They were seeing a very large positive bias compared to their peers. So positive bias, but yet their internal QC was acceptable. Also on their other EQA scheme, performance was acceptable as well. So investigation, what did we do? So always we want to check what our registration details, because like other errors, errors that occur within the system, errors can occur within the quality control aspects as well. So we want to make sure that we're doing a like for like comparison. So we're checking the registration details. We want to ensure that the results are being compared to, to the correct peer group. So in this case, what we do as well is see, oh, well, do the lab's results actually compare better to other peers? Uh, so potentially they may be, once again, in an incorrect method group. And we also then ask for confirmation of the method group. In this case, everything worked out well. So the lab, in this case, Alphost, was correctly registered. Okay, so we go for further information. So we wanted to see a copy of their internal QC data. We wanted to check, are the, NQ, the IQC results, are they within acceptable limits? One of the issues here that we see is the use of wide limits on internal QC. Sometimes, um, different instrument manufacturers, if it's a primary um, internal QC control, they will provide wide limits so that it makes the performance of the instrument appear better. But sometimes those limits are really too wide. So we wanted to, first of all, check about the limits. Also, we want to say we wanted to make sure, do a like for like comparison. So were the methods registered in the second scheme, were they the same? So we want to ensure that any instrument biases that we see, whether it was the same because they were not solely due to the actual method group classification. Uh, after that round of investigation, we saw that everything was still acceptable. Uh, so really, what else do we look at? Well, we wanted to see whether any correction factors being applied. Because it was a systematic error and it was quite a constant bias, uh, we wanted to ensure that the lab themselves weren't introducing any factors uh, into, the, into their system. And this then, after this, the lab originally said to us, no, that they weren't. But once they went and actually checked again, uh, that was the actual reason. So a slope was being applied. In this case, it was a 10% slope for ALT-FOSS. So once the factor was removed, uh, then the performance improved immediately. So what does this indicate? Well, it shows that the internal QC didn't identify the problem, but the external quality assessment did. It also highlights the fact that not only is it important to have external quality assessments, but there are differences that occur between schemes. So it's not only a case of using EQA, but using the correct EQA scheme and then being able to interpret the results correctly. And we'll talk about that more as we go on. So after they re removed the slope, we can see that the performance of the lab improved dramatically. So their bias that they saw then reduced and with, to within one standard deviation. So this was a bias that they had actually introduced into their own system because they did match with the target value that was being presented to them in their internal QC. 
Um, so it was the target that they were using, uh, an inappropriate target that they were using in their internal QC. Uh, and then their performance on the other EQA scheme, this is why they had introduced the 10% slope in, in the first instance. But that was an incorrect assessment. Uh, so once they were running it with Rikus, then that was uh, picked up and they were able to improve their performance moving forward. A second study here was to do with then lithium, and it's a positive bias for lithium. In this case, it was an instrument specific bias. So it wasn't just specifically for the, the individual laboratory, but it was for the instrument as a whole. And in this case here, it was for the VTROS system. And then specifically, it was for one of their slide generations. Now, the thing about a VTROS system is uh, the precision does tend to be very good, but sometimes the accuracy from slide generation to slide generation, it can change. So um, we did a study in conjunction with Ortho and the VTROS system um, running with a flame photometry uh, and running it on patient uh, samples as well. Uh, it was 50 patient samples. It was, as, as I said, it was run by flame photometry and on the VTROS. And it did show a 0.1 millimole positive bias. So working with Ortho then, they adjusted their calibration values downwards over two slide generations. And then the performance overall uh, reduced and we removed the bias out of the system. So another indication here. So not only, so first case study was an individual lab. Second case study is with, it's an instrument bias. And it's not just for the individual lab, but the instrument as a whole. Once again, in this situation, the internal QC wouldn't have picked this up because they were looking specifically just to, and um, within their own peer groups. Um, sorry, I know this says case study two, it's actually case study three. And in this case here, uh, it's another sort of manufacturer rather than an individual uh, case study. So here we see, uh, in this case, it's Biomaria. Then they brought out a new kit, a new uh, kit for their testosterone which was giving much lower results compared to their old system. It was actually an improvement on their old system. But uh, over time, as we can see, is that there, were, uh, there was a bimodal distribution. So there was a separate method. So really what we did in this case to ensure that the two didn't uh, interfere with each other, we created a separate method group uh, for this new one while they adjusted their calibration uh, and then obviously with the new kit. And as we can see that over time, all the users moved to this new kit. You can still see there's still one lab here, which still hasn't moved down, but everyone else then has improved their performance dramatically. And they've now moved more in line with the other peer groups as well. So, I mentioned earlier about internal QC having wide acceptable ranges. Uh, and this is a case study some that we looked at for amylase. In this case here, the lab came to us. Uh, uh, they were commenting that they had a negative bias on their external um, quality assessment and also on their internal quality control. But their internal QC Although it was low, as you can see in the chart here, it was still well within their uh, manufacturer's acceptable limits of two standard deviations. When we look at that in terms of percentage deviation, we can see that it ranged between zero and about minus 10%, around about to those values. Now, when we look at the external quality assessment, 
the SDIs for this lab, they were around two standard deviations away. So the performance was certainly appeared worse on the external quality assessment than it did on the internal. Now, but whenever we look at, once again, percentage deviation, then the values range between five and 10% again. So actually the performance between the two, the internal QC and the external quality assessment actually was very similar. And whenever we, we plot internal QC values that were run around the time that they ran their external quality assessment, we see the performance in many cases was almost identical. But really what the external quality assessment was showing, uh, the performance that it was showing being two standard deviations away rather than the one standard deviation for the internal QC. Basically, the internal QC was making their performance look a lot better than it actually was. So compared to their peers, they were actually performing worse than their peer group. Basically, this is showing that they could perform much better than their peers um, than by improving their control over their internal quality control. So internal QC with wide acceptable limits may hide performance issues. Um, because the acceptable limits on the internal QC material were wide, as I said, the lab thought their performance was better than it was. So once again, external quality assessment demonstrates that the internal QC does not give a full indication of its performance. Remember, total error is your accuracy and your imprecision. So whenever we're looking at internal QC data, it's important to gather the correct information. So some of the things that we look at whenever we're trying to do an evaluation of performance is to look at how often are the internal QCs run, what concentrations. That's another issue with your internal QC is that very often they're over a quite a limited concentration range whereas external quality assessment covers a wider range of concentrations. The, another important aspect is basically how the targets set. Are they set by the laboratory themselves? Uh, and are they a running target, which gradually changes over time? Or are they a fixed target? And basically then is, how is that fixed target determined? Is it a value which is provided by the manufacturer or is it set by the customer and by the, the lab themselves? And probably the last thing as we want to mention there, once again, is how wide are the ranges compared to the external quality assessments? Because very often, as we've just mentioned, wide ranges will hide then performance issues. Always do a like for like comparison. And the easiest way that we have found to do this is to compare them by percentage deviation uh, for comparison. So in this case here, uh, we had a comment from a laboratory saying my internal QC is perfect, but they have, excuse me, uh, my internal QC is perfect, but I have a constant negative bias on RICUS. And as you can see, there is a negative bias being presented here. Whenever the lab uh, presented their internal QC, uh, once again, it wasn't in the form of a chart. It was just in the table of results. Uh, if you remember back to the start of the presentation, we still have labs that uh, present data this way. And it's actually difficult to see the information when it's presented just in the data. Um, so we would always look at charting it out because it certainly is easier to interpret. 
But looking at the information, the mean was very close to the target. The CV was less than 0.5%. Uh, no result was outside of one st st standard deviation. So the performance did look good. However, uh, when you look at that in terms of percentage deviation, uh, level one was minus 1.6%. Their level two was minus 1.49%. Once you plot that on the chart, you can see in comparison to their external quality assessment, this was their internal QC, general performance. And actually, in terms of looking at comparison, their internal QC was very similar to their external quality assessment. But because they weren't charting it and presenting it in a like-for-like -like fashion, then um, it basically, their EQA looked worse, but actually it's no worse than their internal QC was. So always do a like-for-like -like comparison uh, whenever you're doing uh, this interpretive work and investigative work, because it certainly makes life so much easier. So just to wind up, for this aspect, well, when we ask the question, why is external quality assessment required? Well, internal QC alone doesn't address calibration issues, instrument systematic errors, the use of wide acceptable limits, and also then with limited uh, concentration ranges, it doesn't cover the entire clinical range. So how do you choose the right EQA scheme? There are certain things that really you would need to look for. You should look for international accreditation. Um, the international standard for the labs basically then asks you to run an EQA scheme that uh, follows on for the Sentinel 43 standardization for the EQA. You should look for a large number of participants because your peer groups then, the, who you're being compared against, then obviously the stats will improve with a larger number of participants. Most important is you should have a stable and a consistent sample matrix so that uh, any issues that you see in the material and the performance of that material will match with what you're seeing in the patient data. And this is what I'm saying. So the matrix mimics the patient samples. We should have a realistic range of uh, concentrations. Um, so it's there to test you. It's there to test the system. It's not just there to match what the internal QC is, but it's there to look at outside of those internal QC concentrations. Of course, the sample should be assayed blind. And those um, EQA schemes that provide um, always that always provide uh, a low level and a high level. Okay, the samples may be uh, unknown, but certainly if you get too lows or too highs, you know that something's wrong. Um, so by nature, you would tend to rerun uh, something, of course, that you wouldn't do with a patient sample necessarily. Uh, certainly not in the first instance anyway. So the sample should be assayed blind, um, and even within the sample, you don't necessarily want always to have all low levels or all high levels. It should be completely unknown. Frequent analysis is important um, in so much that if you're making a changes to within your internal QC and you have set a new target, then you want to ensure that that target that you have set, then that your performance generally hasn't shifted during that time, during that change, especially if you're then changing calibrations as well within the lab. Um, you want to ensure that you're still, that your accuracy is still uh, within acceptable uh, range. Um, obviously, in order to do that, you want to have a rapid feedback. You don't want to have to wait for weeks uh, to get a report back. So you want a rapid feedback of your reports. 
And of course, then the reports, the information that you get back should be user friendly. Uh, there's no point in getting a report back which you can't understand and which you find difficult to interpret. So a user friendly report is important. Now, as you can see, I haven't mentioned RICUS there at all. These are things that you should look at for any EPA scheme and any EPA scheme. You should try and ensure that these all these aspects are uh, there and are covered. Um, as we mentioned, the international accreditation, just to bring out a few of those aspects once again. Um, as I said, 17043 is the accreditation for EQA. And it's then, uh, it's really, it's mentioned in the 15189 standard for the laboratory. Why is it there? It's there to ensure that the EQA schemes provide a consistent basis for all interested parties uh, to determine the competence of organizations that provide proficiency testing. So just a couple of mentions, what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, we do our stats properly. It means that we have confidence in the samples that we're preparing. Uh, it means that we communicate with regard to the product. Uh, there is a commitment to quality. Um, within the standard as well. It means that when we ensure participant confidentiality and that we try and make sure that there's no collusion or falsification of results. So these are some of the essentials to the, the EPA standard. Large number of participants. So as I mentioned there, yes, you have a larger peer group to compare to. But it also ensures then that there are lots of many different analytical methods. It does mean that certainly looking within your own country, that uh, there would tend to be more instruments maybe spread globally than in your specific country. So whenever you're looking at a regional or a national scheme, um, sometimes the, the numbers in your peer groups are smaller because there's more of them international and there's not as many in your potentially in a regional program. So it increases statistical validity. Okay, sample uh, and a consistent sample matrix. So you want to ensure and increase your confidence that your EQA scheme mirrors that of a patient sample. Concentrations both analytical and clinical ranges should be covered. So that you're covering not just the normal, but you're also your abnormal ranges. As you can see here, why is that important? Well, because in this case, this is one of our charts uh, where we're looking at performance over concentration. So if we only dealt with concentrations which were above 80, then the performance of this lab would be more than acceptable. However, once you start looking at the lower concentrations, then you can see that their precision at those lower concentrations were, was much wider. So you have to ensure that you're covering a, then a wider range of concentrations. In this case, this is the other way around. Okay, and at the lower levels, but as the concentrations increase, then you tend to have not only a wider uh, variance, but also then you start to see a positive bias as well in general. Okay, so the peer groups, I've sort of already mentioned that as well. Um, but the use of the peer group reporting system, maybe I should mention this at this stage, um, it's not the same as an external quality assessment. Um, because once again, your concentrations that you're looking at are limited. You're not looking at the wider range of concentrations. But they are useful, and uh, we would recommend that both are run in combination to give you optimum quality control. So whenever we're looking at the frequent analysis and rapid feedback, then really the important thing here is, is to identify the issues quicker 
The Tick Corrective Action Center, and once again, to cover a wider range of concentrations sooner. So participation in a, a bi-weekly program, the ones that we have, we have found that they tend to be more beneficial than monthly programs. So if samples are not analyzed frequently enough and reports are not returned quickly enough, then it could be several months before potentially you may identify an error. As I mentioned there about our bi-weekly and monthly programs. Uh, we did a study, uh, this is about uh, a few years ago now, in 2017, where we looked at the performance between our bi-weekly scheme and our monthly scheme. And in general, we see that the performance of our bi-weekly participants, uh, they generally perform better than our monthly participants. And this is nothing looking at where the customers are, where the participants are, where they come from, how long they've been running the scheme, uh, if they're large labs, small labs, really it seems to just come down to how frequently they were running their EQA. It also means the labs that were running a more frequent EQA scheme, it does mean that they're looking at, the, they're really wanting to control their performance. They're more interested. It's not to say that the monthly users are not interested, but obviously the thing with, with having more regular and regular feedback is that they can then determine where any errors are starting, starting to um, appear, they can deal with them quicker. So the bi-weekly schemes do tend to perform better. Uh, so that was not only just for chemistry, but it was also the same for immunoassay as well, where the, the bi-weekly immunoassay scheme ran uh, better than the monthly in terms of performance of the labs. Hematology was almost the same case as well. In general, the performance of the bi-weeklies outperformed the monthly scheme. So I mentioned then the user-friendly reports. Um, generally, a lot of labs or a lot of EQA schemes would tend to use the same aspects. So they would tend to use standard deviations and in some cases percentage deviation. But it's how these are presented and the fashion and, um, it makes then how easy it is to interpret the information which is coming back to the laboratory. Um, so, do all EQA schemes meet the same mark and are they all fit for purpose? Well, that is, even labs that are running and do have the same international standard, the 17043, they don't always perform the same way and they're certainly not necessarily uh, fit for purpose. You have to ask the question, well, what is their purpose? Um, in some cases, it is simply a means of a check. So you're checking that your performance, the lab's performance meets an acceptable level. And that tends to be very infrequent. So it's a one-off uh, or multiple times in a year, just a check to see whether the performance still is acceptable. So it's a I use the word policing, but it's a, a, it's a mean by a regulatory body to check performance of the lab. So in this case here, what tends to be the case is that the lab puts all their effort in to ensure that this one set of samples gets analyzed correctly, potentially run multiple times. So it gives a false indication of performance because that's not what you would normally do with your patient samples. So um, really what we would want is that uh, labs would use EQA as a tool to, for the laboratory manager to review and assess the analytical performance. So that you're doing that on a much more regular basis in order to reduce errors, provide confidence, and then, uh, as I say, reduce that total error. We mentioned this at the start uh, about the labor laboratory shall participate. 
um, and, and through robotic comparisons. Uh, but really what I want to mention here now is the next bit um, is then looking at, well, how does this benefit RICUS, I'm sorry, how does this benefit the lab, specifically looking at RICUS itself? How do we fit into what we've just discussed? Well, RICUS is globally accredited. Um, it is cost effective. Whenever we're looking at the consolidation and looking at cost per parameter, we and our sales are a much lower price compared to competing schemes. We have fast turnaround times. Um, we have more than 56,000 participants worldwide and we're still growing. And as we mentioned, not only with the consolidation, which comes into the cost effectiveness uh, and also flexibility for the smaller labs and larger labs. But more importantly is the quality of the material which we provide. Uh, and as we said, we are a manufacturer of third party quality controls, both internal and external. Um, and because we, we have experience in our products, we are able to manufacture them to the highest uh, quality ourselves. We distribute uh, run really, that's roughly now 139 different countries and we cover the majority now. This is an old, I have to, for, you'll have to forgive me, this is an old map that I drew up uh, before. Uh, so some of the countries that we have maybe aren't actually highlighted. Um, but as you can see, we are a global EQA scheme and we cover most of the globe. Um, we're currently expanding, uh, and these are just some, this is our current EQA scheme, and some of the products that we've just recently introduced this year. So the one, these are this year's, where we've introduced uh, neonatal bilirubins, cytokines, serum indices, and a new monthly cardiac plus program, together with a new serology program for the uh, COVID. We're currently running a five-part differential and reticulocyte pilot as well, and that's almost finished. So the report for that will be coming out um, in the near future. We're also working on development of new uh, and exciting uh, programs here for moving into 2022. So um, as I said, there. Are this is really what we want to finish on this morning, why you want to run the external quality assessment. Because it's not only the fact that you're participating, but it's also then what you do with that information. So basically the second part of that sentence in that section was that the laboratory management shall monitor the results and participate in the implementation of corrective actions when control criteria are not fulfilled. So you're using EQA not just for policing, but you're using EQA basically to correct yourself, to correct the errors that are being determined. So in itself, it doesn't lead to an improvement. You have to con come to your conclusions you have to put corrective actions into place and you have then to check the effectiveness. And one of the reasons why we talk about having frequent EQA schemes and frequent participation is to ensure that you can check the effectiveness of the corrective actions that you're putting into place. So whenever you have an error, we're, we're not going to go into this today. I've only got basically two slides just to talk about this. Um, really just to mention that uh, always, well, it, it, it may seem simple, but always do the investigation first uh, before starting with the action. Always ask the questions first, but record all the actions that have taken place so that it's easy to follow the trail of information so looking at maintenance logs of the instruments, looking at reagent logs, ensuring all the information is signed and dated so that you can follow the trail and see where the errors may have occurred. 
We do provide even ourselves uh, a valuable EQA performance checklist, which gives you a simple way of going down, looking at potential issues from specimen handling, clerical issues, looking at the, the peer group that you're being compared against, asking questions about the internal quality control, calibration, specific questions about the instrument and the reagents, and then also the EQA sample itself. So once again, looking to come to the root cause of the problem, come to a conclusion, and then looking at what the remedi remedial action was that was put into place, so that all that information then can be used to improve performance. Last slide is basically just to say, okay, really what we want to do, we want to establish what the root cause is of the problem. We, look at, we want to ask, well, what we say is five whys. Keep asking the question why. Why did things happen? What happened? Why did it happen? And how can we prevent it from happening again? And then how do we know that we made a difference? And this is one of the things that EQA does. It provides confidence so that you can look at how you've changed your performance over time and how do we know that we've made a difference. And as we see here, just very last sentence, it's a team approach. So not only does it involve the individual technicians, but also the quality managers, the laboratory directors, it's involved in all aspects and the quality management system that we have, that we put into place. Same for EQA, it's to ensure that we provide a good patient care to um, our patients. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, that is what I've finished with today. There are so many things that we could talk about with regards to then looking at RICUS interpreting the reports, looking at troubleshooting, and all those various aspects. So if you do want to have, and if you do have more questions, and we're more than happy to provide additional training, and I'm sure then, uh, Oshin, if you want to, just to mention this um, then further on, uh, but for ourselves within the RICUS department, and obviously as Randox as a whole, uh, thank you for attending today and thank you for listening.